Blog Talk Radio. Carry on my wayward son. There'll be peace when you are done. Lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Wayward News Network. I'm your host, Johnny Henderson. Here we are on the cusp of a new year, just a few hours away from 2011. Uh, if you're out partying and carrying on this this evening, I, I really want to encourage you to be responsible. Don't drink and drive. There's a lot of innocent people out there. Uh, nobody needs to be hurt because you want to be careless. Uh, before we get started tonight, I, I want to take just a couple of minutes and thank a few people. You know, it's been a very trying year, and it's been hard to to get a lot of things done, but every week my wife consistently makes sure that the show is ready to go so that, uh, you know, I can bring the information to you that I do. So I want to thank my wife and my family, and I want to remember our friends down in the Gulf who've been affected by the BP oil spill, Kendra and Vicki, Joni and Greg. You know, these people down there are having a really, really hard time, and I want to tell them really quick, because I know there's been some issues. Uh, some people use a, a medical um, treatment called MMS, and others don't. I don't want to weigh in too heavy, but I will say that I used MMS when the swine flu outbreak was, was at its peak. Everyone I worked with was sick with swine flu. And while I used MMS, I never got sick once. So I can say that it does have some some benefits. You know, give it a chance. Uh, I'm not a doctor, but I will say that it worked for me. I also want to thank my friends Steve and Nathan and Rick and Gene and Cal. I want to thank everyone who's took the time to be a guest on this show and everybody who's took the time to listen. And I want to thank some other friends of mine who... They've just always been there when I needed them to. I want to thank Angel and Michelle and Monica and and Lindsay and Jacinda and Tish. I appreciate, you know, y'all being my friend. And I hope you have a much better year than you had last year. Having said that, uh, I've really enjoyed doing the show. But I've recently come into more information and... It's a bit controversial. Tonight's show may sting a little bit if you've never heard any of this information. So I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but I would not be doing you a favor if I didn't report the things that I've learned. With me tonight is pastor and author Bill Hughes. Now, Bill has written a couple of fascinating books, and if you... Have the opportunity to get them. I would really recommend picking those books up and checking them out. One is called The Enemy Unmasked, and the other is The Secret Terrorist. Now, we always hear that our enemy is is Middle Eastern men with turbans. Now, they may have some beef against us, but they are not the only enemies of, of humanity. And... Tonight, we're going to learn a little bit about who our secret enemy is. Bill, welcome to the show. Johnny, it's good to be with you tonight. And it's a blessing to me to to have you on. I never dared dream that I would get you on, you know. I'm sure that you're a very busy man, you know, being an author and a pastor and all the million other things that you do. Well, Johnny, it's uh, it's nice to be with you and... Uh... You know, as you stated in your opening remarks, your your wife doing such a, a very admirable job, and uh, you know, she she called me. I think Johnny, it was at least a month ago, and and asked if I could be on uh, New Year's Eve, and you know, so she's really on the ball, Johnny, and uh, you've got you've got a, a fine lady there at your side, as as well as I do down here in Florida, because uh, I know with all the many and sundry things, Johnny, that I do from preaching and traveling across the world and writing books and getting materials out to people. You know, it uh, it's a real blessing to have a, a, a special lady behind you, and, and my wife has stood with me, and uh, it's been a great blessing to me too. So uh, 
But I'm glad I can be with you tonight, Johnny, and, uh, you know, go over some of this material from my books. Well, very good. I, and I do, I consider myself very fortunate to have the wife that I have. Um, I would be like a paraplegic without her. <laughs> I really would. Well, anyway, uh, Bill, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, for those who don't know any more about you than other than what I've said. Johnny, basically I... Um... I've been a teacher for most of my uh, professional life. Um, I have done some pastoral work as well. And uh, then I've I've been in ministry for the last 25 years, starting back in 1985 up in the uh, uh, area of the northeast part of this country in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and then have uh, pastored and taught in uh, uh, South Lake Tahoe, California, and then in uh, Northern California, and now currently I'm back here in Florida, and uh, very, very thankful, Johnny, because uh, not only having written books and, and traveled many different places around the world, from Africa to the Middle East to uh, Europe, uh, South Central America, uh, the Far East, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, where I've been had the privilege to preach. Uh, but um, I've also, Johnny, had the great blessing of being able to send literature um, into over 100 countries across the world. So I feel very, very fortunate, Johnny. Uh, God has been very good to me. And, um, you know, in writing the books that I have, as, as you mentioned, the, the material is, is somewhat volatile. Uh, it, it either upsets people or it just absolutely galvanizes and thrills people. Um, but nevertheless, I don't see how you're still alive writing those books. Well, you know, Johnny, I've had uh, several um, several threats that have been made. I, I uh, had some meetings a few years ago out in Oregon, and before we went out, before I went out there to speak. Um, we mass mailed my first book, The Secret Terrorist, and invited people to, to the meetings I was going to have. And um, there were threats made, Johnny. People said if, if Hughes shows up to the meeting, we'll burn the building down. Um, uh, you know, I've had people, uh, after we've they've gotten my book in the mail, they, they send it back uh, after having sent it through a shredder, and it looks like spaghetti noodles. And then they've attached a sticky note to it, and they've said, you're next. So, uh, you know, and then I've had people in, in law enforcement write to me, and um, people from Tallahassee have written to me and said, you know, we're getting all kinds of complaints about what you've written, and, uh, you know, you need to stop. And I've simply said to them, Johnny, um, you know, I have three three purposes uh, in my professional life. Number one uh, is to help people understand what is going on in the past, uh, in the present, and in the future. Number two, it's to try to engage people in Bible studies so that they can have peace and hope for today in Jesus Christ. And number three, Johnny, it's to help people to be ready for the second coming of Christ, which I believe is imminent. Um, I believe the events taking place in our world tell us so. So, Johnny, that's that's been my whole goal in writing the books that I have, and you know, if people express their displeasure and and uh, in cruel and uh, deadly ways, well, you know, they can do that, Johnny. But I I have a mission, uh, you know, I have a, a a purpose for why I'm here. God's made me, and and so He's protected me and taken care of me to do what I'm doing. Well, I'm, I'm glad that he has because, man, wow, those books. And we'll get into what's in those books in just a couple of minutes. But uh, nearly everything in there is 100% documentable. Uh, it can, you can prove everything that you've written in there. People just do the legwork and the research. It, it, it's amazing to me that so many people would just reject it. Well, the the fact of the matter is, Johnny, and... See, Johnny, in writing in writing books and doing research for many, many years and teaching uh, young people, both junior high and high school age young people, how to research and how to write papers 
so that they could then in turn learn and be able to do it for themselves. Uh, I always demanded of my students, Johnny, that they would always have support for what they were saying. They had to be able to back it up because, you know, as I tell people, I say opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one. And, uh, you know, so that doesn't fly, Johnny. And so um, back, you know, nearly 10 years ago when I felt just deeply impressed that a book needed to be written, and that's when I wrote the book The Secret Terrorist. Um, it was it was crucial to me, Johnny, that if if I made any statement that was um, different or unique or uh, something you just don't hear, um, Johnny, I, I needed to have at least two witnesses. I had to have at least two sources that backed up the conclusion that I was drawing. And Johnny, if I didn't have that, if I didn't have at least two witnesses, I wouldn't put it in my books. Um, the it's reason you Johnny, say that because I was reading in the Bible this morning that it said something to the effect of out of the mouth of two or three witnesses the truth will be established. That that was the principle, Johnny, that I went by, uh, not only in my teaching, uh, but also in my own writing, and that that was the principle that Christ laid down in Scripture that uh, you got to have you got to have authority, Johnny. You got to have witnesses to back it up, and Christ said that. So. Um, That was very, very important to me, and I knew that the material I was looking at was was volatile. I knew it was alarming. I knew it was uh, shocking, and it was it's frightening to many, many people. But um, Johnny, you know, let's face it: uh, the material in my books is not what you typically hear or see in a typical history book in a high school program. Uh, or a college course. You you just don't read what I have put into these books. And basically, Johnny, what I've done is gleaned from many, many different sources. And the the people, Johnny, that, that I've talked about in my books, from, you know, presidents to statesmen to congressmen to Supreme Court justices to uh, famous Americans like Samuel B. Morse, who I quote in in several chapters of my book, um, Johnny, you know the, these people are prominent um, Americans or statesmen that that the world is familiar with, and I've just looked yes, at them, Johnny, in in the light of what they've said, and in the light of trends and and what was going on uh, to help people see the true history. Of America, past, present, and future. And, and I've scoured over a lot of the documents that you cite from, and uh, tracked down a lot of source materials. And you are right on the money with this. Now, before well, uh, we get out of here tonight, I hope you'll tell everybody how they can actually get a copy of your books. Oh, Johnny, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, no problem at all. Johnny, it's it's crucial. The material we're dealing with is crucial, and um, it demands, Johnny, it demands a, a high standard. And I and I've sought to meet a standard whereby uh, people could could say, "Hey, this is the truth," and I'm standing on this. And uh, and that's why I've I've gone and done the research that I have. You know, in in uh, getting material and backing up conclusions that I've made. It's very important to me. You've been very thorough. Very, very thorough. Now, I guess everybody's wondering, what are we talking about? (laughs) Do you uh, feel like maybe pulling back the veil and and giving them a little bit? Well, I guess, Johnny, to to summarize um, both of my books, you really, Johnny, would have to go back to the 16th century because the 16th century, Johnny, uh, brought about two two religious uh, political movements uh, that that still are with us today. That that still, Johnny, today are profoundly influencing and affecting the this entire planet. And the two movements, Johnny, that I'm referring to, one is the one that began 
basically, you know, as we look at history, we we say that the Protestant Reformation began when Martin Luther stood at the Diet of Worms in 1521 before Charles V and all the Holy Roman Empire and said, you know, unless you can prove to me from, from Scripture or from the clearest of reasoning, he said, I cannot and I will not retract. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. And, Johnny, when Martin Luther said those words, it, it literally um, it set Europe ablaze because here was a man who was willing to stand up to the tyranny uh, to the tyranny and the evils of the the Roman Catholic Church system, and um, you know, Johnny, that Luther got something started, and it continued in the 1520s into the 1530s, and of course, it's still with us today. But Johnny, another another group, um, as as Luther and the the Protestant Reformation that was coming from all over Europe, as it started out, Johnny, and just just set Europe on fire. The Roman Catholic Church was tumbling. It was reeling, and it was about to to tumble and to die. And Johnny, um, history tells us that in the mid-1530s, the Roman Catholic Church was looking for anything that it could hold on to, that it could grasp, that could somehow counter and oppose the Protestant Reformation. And it was at that time, Johnny, in the mid-1530s, that a man by the name of Ignatius Loyola created a society which he dubbed the Society of Jesus. And for some of us who are familiar with this group, which is still with us today, it's called the Jesuit Order. And... um, you know, a lot of people, Johnny, look now, at this. They're just a bunch of priests, aren't they? What's that? Aren't they just a bunch of priests? Well, Johnny, that's that's what a lot of people have been taught. But uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, and I I quote him in my book. Let me see if I can pull it off real quick here. Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, see here. Here's an example, Johnny, of what we're saying. Napoleon Bonaparte was a of course, a great French ruler in the 19th century, um, you know, a very, very famous man. From history. Oh, absolutely. Well, a book written by General Monsalon called The Memorial of the Captivity of Napoleon at St. Helena, pages 62 and 174. This is what Napoleon Bonaparte said in this man's book. He said the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power, power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses. The general of the Jesuits insists on being master sovereign over the sovereign. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be masters cost what it may. It's a very important statement Bonaparte's making there, Johnny. When the Jesuits are allowed in a country... Um, they will become the rulers. And it doesn't matter what the cost will be. If if men in their order must die, if there must be wars, if there must be depressions, if there must be uh, economic collapse, if there must be disasters, if there must be assassinations, it makes no difference, Johnny. Uh, those things will happen. Until the Jesuits. Do you think they're at work today? Oh, Johnny, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. In in so many different capacities, Johnny. Um, and you know, um, let me. Well, I would just go ahead and answer it. You've asked. Um, 
Johnny, there's so many secret organizations today, and I'll, I'll give you a prime uh, illustration of what I'm talking about. Back in 2004, there was a presidential election here in the United States of America. Uh, the Republican uh, candidate for the presidency at that time was George Bush. Uh, his Democratic counterpart was a man by the name of John Kerry. Now, Americans were uh, told you have two uh, two men running for office. One's a Republican, one's a Democrat. They each are, are promoting a different agenda. And uh, you have a choice as to who you want to be in the White House for the next four years. Well, uh, doing a little bit of research about both men, uh, and it was very common knowledge back at the time they were running, both of those men were part of and had been initiated into an order of men when they were at Yale University, and it was called the Order of Skull and Bones. Well, in doing a little bit of research about Skull and Bones, Skull and Bones was actually created at Yale University in 1831 or 1832 by a man named William Huntington Russell. And Russell, prior to forming the Order of Skull and Bones at Yale in 1832, he had been traveling in Germany and throughout Europe and he had gone to several secret society meetings over there. And uh, one of them, it was called the Thule Death Society. And uh, that was a part of the Illuminati. Okay? So then when, when you look at the rise of the Illuminati and who it was that formed the Illuminati... Back in the 18th century, it was created by a man named Adam Weishaupt. And Johnny, it's it's now, very not a dead, but... absolutely he was. Um, as I quote in my book, The Enemy Unmasked, Adam Weishaupt created the Illuminati in 1776, uh, right at the very time just prior to the American Revolution beginning in. Uh, you know, July of 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. But um, Weishaupt was teaching Roman Catholic canon law at a Jesuit university in Bavaria, Germany, which was the Jesuit stronghold in Germany in Bavaria. And the principles of the Illuminati, if you study the principles <laughs> of the Illuminati, and the principles of the Jesuits, they are virtually identical. Adam Weishaupt was nothing but a foot soldier for the black pope at that time, whose name was uh, Lorenzo Risi. So here you have, Johnny, you have the Jesuit order. They created the Illuminati as a front organization. The Illuminati then creates the Thule Death Society in Germany, and then, through William Huntington Russell, it creates a, another front organization at Yale University called the Order of Skull and Bones. And all the young men who are initiated into the Order of Skull and Bones at Yale University, they have to bow in absolute obeisance to three figures in their initiation. The first figure, Johnny, is a... The, the head of the Masonic order. The second figure is a man who is a figure for the white pope. And what I mean by the white pope is the visible pope that everybody sees. In this case, it would be Benedict XVI. The other caricature or figure that every person must bow in absolute obedience to in taking their initiation is the Jesuit general or the Black Pope? So, Johnny, I've, I've, you, I've done some. Uh, to get ready for this research or this interview, I've tried to do a, a little bit of research on my own, and uh, what I found is I think the current Black Pope is a man named Adolfo Pachon. Is that correct, or have they changed? Uh, the man I've heard Johnny recently was Nicholas Adolphus. 
He took over okay. for Peter Hans Kolbenbach. Okay, so, Nicholas Pichon, or uh, Nicholas Adolphus, as far as I know. Adolphus. Okay, let me write that down. Yeah. But man, some of the stuff that you know that I, I found just you know grazing the surface of this uh, studying about the Jesuits, they've been linked to assassinations of American presidents, the formation of the Federal Reserve, uh, professional football teams, uh, world wars. Um, what else? Terrorist attacks, uh, anything from the World Trade Center to the uh, Pearl Harbor. I mean, uh, if it's true, these guys have had their hands in everything. Johnny, as Napoleon Bonaparte said, when they come into a country, and I'll read it again, it says, wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be the masters cost what it may. Their society is by nature dictatorial. Therefore, it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, is a meritorious work. Johnny, you know, I've read that they were linked to the sinking of the Titanic. Johnny, there's no doubt Um from from Pearl Harbor, and we could go into each one of those things, Johnny. You mentioned assassinations of American presidents. Uh, you mentioned yes, you mentioned the Twin Towers and 9/11. You mentioned Pearl Harbor and the sinking of the Titanic. And Johnny, you know, however you want to go, but uh, we could look at each one of those things and show beyond a shadow of a doubt beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, the involvement of and the perpetration of all of those heinous crimes against humanity lay at the footsteps of the Jesuit order. There's no doubt. Well, maybe so, you can give us just a peek. It may be some assassinations, the Titanic, and uh, the World Trade Center. That's fine, Johnny. Uh, oh, actually, I've like, heard they were involved in the the BP oil spill. Johnny, that that I cannot conclusively say. Um, to be very very uh, frank with you, I know that uh, there were some uh, Roman Catholics that were involved in the higher echelons of of the uh, BP oil company, but. Uh, Exactly, well, Johnny. We first, we're not saying that Roman Catholics are bad people, are we? Johnny, this this has nothing to do. This has absolutely nothing to do with individual Roman Catholic people. Uh, there are precious, devout, uh, loving Roman Catholics that love Jesus Christ and are following and living up to all the light that he has given to them. So, no, we're not talking about individual Roman Catholics at all. What we're dealing with here, Johnny, is a system, uh, a system of men that uh, behind the scenes plan things and then use various men to carry out their dastardly deeds. Um, that's what we're talking about. What's that? I said, oftentimes they seem to have scapegoats or blame somebody else for it. Well, Johnny, that that's what my book, The Enemy Unmasked, is all about. Um, because when you look at, Johnny, for example, um, you look at communism. Let, let's just take that here just, just briefly. Um, okay. Most people, Johnny, would say, well, communism was the result of Karl Marx's book, The Communist Manifesto, written around 1850. And then from Karl Marx, you know, um, um, Vladimir Ulanov or Nikolai Lenin, that is the same name, and Joseph Stalin uh, and Mao Zedong in China, you know, these guys picked up the principles of Karl Marx and they made the 20th century a bloodbath in Russia and China. And so... You know, Johnny, you look at it and you say, well, you know, Lenin and Stalin and Mao Zedong, they were such evil and awful men. 
and so was Karl Marx for creating a communistic uh, form of government. Well, Johnny, if you go back, if you go back to the 1600s, Johnny, it's it's historical fact. It's historical fact that Jesuit priests started some reductions or small communities with the Guarani Indians in Paraguay in the 1600s. And, Johnny, it was on those reductions that the Jesuit order perfected the principles of communism. And, Johnny, it was from those communist reductions in Paraguay with the Guarani Indians that the Jesuit order made billions of dollars billions of dollars to fight their wars, to assassinate kings, to bribe people to do what they wanted them to do. It's a fact of history, Johnny. Now, what happened was from around 1600 to 1750, the Jesuits perfected those principles. Those principles, Johnny, were then incorporated into the Illuminati by Jesuit foot soldier Adam Weishaupt. Then... In the in the late right around the time of the French Revolution in the 1790s, the principles of communism were were used in the French Revolution, and it was right during that time that a group of called Jacobins or the League of Just Men they started to put together the ideas of the Communist Manifesto. And Johnny, by the mid 1800s, when Karl Marx wrote that book, the principles and the actual book had already been written, and Karl Marx's name was simply put on it. But Johnny, communism is the result of the Jesuit reductions in Paraguay. And that's where communism started. Uh, that's the reason started. we're seeing kind of a a shift towards socialism and communism in America now. Absolutely, Johnny. Because see, Johnny, socialism or communism, it's it's the perfect style of government for authoritarian tyrants who want to control absolute control over every human being on the face of the earth. And you see, Johnny, in a socialist or communist form of government, the government gets more and more and more control, and and government is controlled by a few people, and they in turn control all the masses of people. And it makes it so simple, Johnny, for the Jesuit order to, to rule over a country that is communistic or socialistic because all they've got to do is control a few men and then they control the entire nation. And that's why America is going the way it is today. Now, Johnny, if you want to get back, you you asked about assassinations of presidents, you asked about 9-11, you asked about uh, um, the Titanic. We can get into all those at this point now. Um, yes, Johnny, please. this is very fascinating. Johnny, there there have been uh, several American presidents that have been assassinated. Now, the ones that we always start with, we say, well, you know, the first assassination was Abraham Lincoln in uh, April of 1865, right on the the heels of the civil of the finishing of the Civil War. And, of course, Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth in Ford's Theater, Washington, D.C., April 14 or 15 of 1865. And then, of course, we say, you know, in 1881, James A. Garfield was gunned down. Uh, And then uh, in 1901, um, uh, William McKinley was gunned down. And then in 1963, John F. Kennedy was gunned down. Now, and that's true, Johnny. All of those men were shot and killed. However, Johnny, it's, and I I mention this in my book, The uh, Secret Terrorist, that the first man who almost was assassinated as a president was Andrew Jackson. Now, Andrew Jackson, as well as any and every American president, Johnny, 
uh, they had problems. They were not perfect men. Andrew Jackson, of course, was one of the men who led the uh, many of the Indian tribes out of the South and uh, on their, their terrible trail of tears that, that ended up in the reservations of Oklahoma and, uh, you know, the Midwest. So Andrew Jackson was not an angel. So let, let's make that clear right off. However, Andrew Jackson, um, he put his presidency on the line uh, when in the early 1830s he went head-to-head -head with the head of the Federal Reserve at that time, a man by the name of Nicholas Biddle. And Nicholas Biddle wanted to reestablish the charter for the Federal Reserve Bank that had been started right after the War of 1812. And Andrew Jackson said, no way, the Federal Reserve Bank is destroying America. It's in the hands of a few wealthy and powerful men in Europe. It has nothing to do with America. All it wants to do is enslave America economically. So Andrew Jackson said, no. And so Nicholas Biddle and Andrew Jackson went at each other's throats. And uh, if Nicholas Biddle had not become so arrogant, Johnny, uh, he probably would have uh, gotten Jackson out of office. But the fact is Andrew jo Jackson won that battle with Biddle, and uh, he stopped the reestablishment of the Federal Reserve Bank. Well, Right on the heels of that in 1835, a man by the name of Richard Lawrence tried to kill Andrew Jackson. And Richard Lawrence was promised by wealthy, powerful people in Europe. And I quoted in my book, The Secret Terrorist. He was told, if you get caught, we will be sure that you are set free. Well... Johnny, the thing you've got to ask yourself is this. Number one, who was it? Who were the wealthy, powerful people in Europe <coughs> that told Richard Lawrence to kill Andrew Jackson? Well, it, it's those same wealthy, powerful people that told Richard Lawrence that, that encouraged him to kill Jackson. These were the same wealthy, powerful people that were behind and controlling the central bank in the United States. And as I quote repeatedly in my book, The Secret Terrorist, the Rothschild family of Europe is that powerful banking family that controlled the like central the bank. They're the Vatican, aren't they? Absolutely, they are. From F. Tupper Saucy's book, Rulers of Evil, page 161, Saucy says that he looked up in the Encyclopedia Judaica the name Rothschild, and it said, these men are the guardians of the Vatican's treasury. So the Rothschilds and the Jesuit order and the Catholic Church work hand in hand. And where the Rothschilds are, the Jesuits are. Where the Rothschilds are, the Catholic Church is. So they wanted to have a central bank in America so they could control the flow of money. As uh, Amschild Rothschild once said, Mayor Amschild Rothschild, he said, uh, he said, I just believe in the golden rule. The one who has the gold makes the rules. And uh, that's what they sought to do in the United States with the establishment of a central bank. When Andrew Jackson stood in their way, and said there will be no central bank in this country. The Rothschilds were furious. Nicholas Biddle was furious. The Jesuit order was furious. So they got Richard Lawrence to try to kill Andrew Jackson in 1835. It's a fact of history. Fact of history. Now, you come up five years later. The man who won the election of 1840, his name was William Henry Harrison. Now, we have to understand, and most people that understand a little bit about American history understand that it was at this time in the 1830s and the 1840s that Americans were starting to get agitated over the issue of slavery. 
And one man in particular who was really agitating it was a South Carolina um, politician by the name of John C. Calhoun. And uh, Calhoun was saying that blacks have no rights that, that white men should respect. And John C. Calhoun was telling the people of South Carolina that if they were not get, being treated fairly uh, among the representative states, that the people of South Carolina had every right to secede from the Union. Well, William Henry Harrison gets into office in 1840, gives his inaugural address. He's a 67-year-old man, but he's as healthy as a whippersnapper, and he gets up in his inaugural address, and I quote it in my book, The Secret Terrorist. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, fascinating statement that he makes. Um, yeah, here it is. This was from William Henry Harrison's uh, inaugural address. He said this, We admit of no government by divine right, believing that so far as power is concerned, the beneficent creator has made no distinction among men, that all are upon an equality, and that the only legitimate right to govern is upon the expressed grant of power from the governed. Now those words for us today, we say, well, big deal. You know, who cares? What, what, what's the difference? He's just saying that, that we're all created equal. Well, I believe that, you believe that, so what's, what's the issue? Well, William Henry Harrison said, we admit of no government by divine right. Now, what did, what did he mean by the divine right? Johnny, throughout the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church believed that every king that ruled throughout Europe, they were there because of the order of divine right. And the Catholic Church, because they claim that the Pope is the vicar of Christ or the representative of God on earth, they claimed that every ruler ruled their nation because God, through the Pope, gave it to them. And because they were put into office by God through the Pope, those kings had to do exactly as the Pope dictated. Now, is that a big deal? Well, you go back to England in the 16th century, during the time of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, she ruled from 1558 to 1603 in England. When Queen Elizabeth came into power in England, the, the Pope at that time, he said, look, if Elizabeth will make herself and her kingdom a slave or a fife of the Holy See, then everything will be fine. We'll get along well. But if she doesn't, all hell will break loose. And Johnny, history records from us for us in a book called The Babington Plot by W.E.C. Shepard. Fantastic book. In that book, that man shows that there were at least 10 to 12 assassination attempts on the life of Queen Elizabeth during her reign. And because the Jesuit order and the Catholic Church did not succeed in killing Elizabeth, they got Philip II of Spain in 1580 to build the most powerful fleet of ships this world has ever seen. Do you know what they were called? What was it? It's called the Spanish Armada. I do remember reading about the Spanish Armada. Well, the reason the Armada was built, Johnny, was so that the Catholic Church, through their children in Spain, could go right up the western side of Europe and invade England and take it over, kill Elizabeth, and turn England back into a slave of the Catholic Church. Incredible. Well, uh, uh, they're associated with the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, too, aren't they? Absolutely, Johnny. 
Abraham Lincoln, um, Abraham Lincoln believed that black me- black men deserve to have freedom, and um, Abraham Lincoln believed in what the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution said. Uh, Abraham Lincoln believed that we were created equal and that every man had the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Before Abraham Lincoln ever got to Washington, it's a fact of history, as he was going to Washington, D.C. there in 1860, 1861, uh, there was a Catholic mob waiting in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, that when Lincoln would get off the train to take a break, Uh, They were going to stab him to death. Uh, But, of course, that never happened. Lincoln went on to the White House. And Lincoln's desire to keep the states together, the papacy hated that. What, What the Catholic Church and the Jesuit order wanted with the Civil War was to split this nation in half so that both sides would be weakened by their disunity, and by them being split in half, the Catholic Church could control both sides. And uh, Lincoln kept the states together. Uh, Of course, the 11 southern states seceded, but Lincoln strove with all he had to get the southern states back into the Union so that there could be the United States. And well, now, they hated a, uh, Lincoln long before that, too, didn't they? What's that, Johnny? Uh, the, didn't the Jesuit order hate Lincoln prior to his becoming president? Because I was reading oh, ab- something about a, a priest named Charles Chinaquay. Absolutely, Johnny. Back in uh, eight, the middle of the 1850s, there was a Catholic priest who wrote a fantastic book called Fifty Years in the Church of Rome uh, by Charles Chinaquay. And Charles Chinaque was a Catholic priest. He was uh, uh, he did not drink alcohol. He was the apostle of temperance for Canada, for the Catholic churches in Canada. And he would go throughout the Catholic churches of Canada and uh, encourage the Catholic people to not drink. Well, that was fine for the people. But then when Chinaque would go to uh, meetings of the priests, uh, and they would be sitting at the table just guzzling bottles of alcohol, Chinaque would not be drinking. And this became very, very upsetting to many of the leading Catholic uh, cardinals and bishops in Chicago, especially Chicago and St. Louis. So what they did was they bribed one of the uh, priest sisters to accuse Chenequi of of trying to uh, solicit uh, sex from her. And uh, Chenequi was put on trial, and uh, it appeared as though he was going to be sentenced to uh, the penitentiary for life. But um, some men said to Charles Chenequi, they said, you know, you've got one one hope and one hope alone, and that's uh, from a lawyer in uh, in Illinois that can help you. And, and Chenequi said, well, who is he? And they said, the man's name is Abe Lincoln. And so Lincoln came and helped Chenequi, and uh, through a miracle of God, a, a person came forward and showed that the lady who accused Chenequi was lying, and uh, Chenequi was let go. And as Lincoln and Chenequi left the courthouse that day, uh, Chenequi started to weep, and Abraham Lincoln looked at him and said, Mr. Chenequi, you should be thrilled. You're, free, you're a free man. Chenequi said, uh, Mr. Lincoln, my tears are not for me, they're for you. Because in this courthouse, courthouse today, I saw 10 to 12 Jesuit priests from Chicago and St. Louis, and I read the sentence of your death in their eyes. So... Before Lincoln ever got to the White House, Johnny, um, he he was a marked man. And um, finally, in the 18, right around 1863, 1864, um, people started gathering 
in a home of a devout Roman Catholic woman by the name of Mary Surratt right there in Washington, D.C., and uh, young men now, would gather. that was gathered. where his assassination was uh, planned, wasn't it? That's exactly right, Johnny. That's exactly right. And it wasn't just Lincoln, Johnny, who they wanted to kill that night. Uh, they wanted to kill Andrew Johnson, the vice president. They wanted to kill William Seward, the secretary of state. And they wanted to also kill Ulysses S. Grant, who was then the commander-in-chief of the northern forces of the Union Army. Um, of course, Lincoln was shot and killed. Uh, Andrew Johnson, um, he, he survived the night. William Seward was was nearly stabbed to death by a man named Louis Payne, who was part of the conspiracy, and William Seward survived. Ulysses S. Grant had to go out of town to New Jersey on a train, so uh, he was not killed either. But um, it it wasn't just a desire to kill Lincoln, Johnny. It, it was a, an attempt in one night to completely destroy the governmental structure of the United States government and to, to create total chaos in Washington, D.C. Um, and that's what the Jesuit order tried to do. Well, we're starting to run out of time, and we had not even scratched the surface of all the questions I've got for you. Uh, so let me hit just a couple of them, uh, if you don't mind. Now, have you ever read anything about the Jesuit order and the formation of the Islamic religion? Yes, I have, Johnny. Um, the or is that going Jes- to be too entailed to get into tonight? Well, Johnny, we could do it real quickly. Um, okay. you go back. You go back, Johnny, to the oh, fourth, fifth, sixth, sixth centuries. Uh, The papacy has risen up to power right around 538 A.D. through the decree of Justinian. And a goal, Johnny, a goal that the Catholic Church had for centuries was to take over Jerusalem. Because the Pope saw Jerusalem as the the 24-karat gold city of the world. Uh, the, they still the have city. their eye on it, don't they? Oh, absolutely, Johnny. They still do today. And that that's one of their goals, um, is to take it over and to bring the Pope there to rule the world from Jerusalem. But um, So they, they wanted desperately, Johnny, to gain control of Jerusalem. and But there were Christians there, and of course there were very devout Jews there in Jerusalem. So they they said, now how are we going to get the Jews and the Christians out of Jerusalem and out of Israel? So they looked around, Johnny, and they saw all of these Arabs in northern Africa and in the Middle East, just hordes of, of Arabs, nomads. And they said, if we could unite all of these Arabs under one man, we could then create an army. We could man their army. We could feed them. We could provide them the weapons they would need. And so, Johnny, what they did was is they got a very, very wealthy Catholic woman who had gone into a convent. Her husband had died. She was left a fortune. She gave the fortune to the church. She was a very intelligent woman. Uh, and, of course, very wealthy, but she went into this convent. While she was there, they took her out. Her name was Khadija, and they said, Khadija, we have a mission for you. Uh, We have a man that we are raising up in the Middle East, and we want you to go and marry him. And through your influence and through the influence of others, we want to use him to become the unifying factor in in unifying all of the Arab peoples together into one group. And, Johnny, the man who Khadija married was a man by the name of Muhammad. And Muhammad, in the 
you know, late 6th and into the 7th century, united all the Arabs together. And then, Johnny, through a series of crusades, uh, the Arabs went in and attacked Jerusalem. And by about the 9th century, they had driven the Jews and the Christians out of Jerusalem and had gained control of it. And at that point, the Pope then turned to the Arab generals and said, Now give me Jerusalem. We gave you the weapons. We gave you the manpower. We fed you. We took care of you. Now you give us what we wanted. Well, Johnny, at that time, the Arab generals had become so powerful, they looked and they said, Look, you want it? You come and get it. And, Johnny, that's why for the next six or 700 years, Catholic mercenaries were going repeatedly across Europe over to Jerusalem to try to drive the Arabs out of Jerusalem. The Crusades were fought uh, because the Arabs said no to the Pope. And uh, so that, Johnny, is the that that's how Catholicism created Islam, and uh, they were the ones that started it. They still have quite a few links today. Um, without going into too much detail, but th- th- there's a lot of similarities between the two. And I know that one of the people who helped Muhammad interpret his visions was a man named Warakwai, who was a Catholic. Absolutely. I don't know if you've ever read that. You yes, I have, have, Johnny. Yes, I have. And, and the two are still linked very closely today. People may think they're a war together, but, I, I mean, I've done, I've tried to do my research on this since I, I read this book, and, man, it's amazing how close they are together. They're they're not the enemies everybody thinks they are. Not at all, Johnny. In fact, um, Johnny, all, all of the major leaders of Islam today, from the man in Iran to Saddam Hussein when he was in Iraq to the uh, Hassads in Syria, Johnny, all of those top men are have been and are 33rd degree Masons. And as Alberto Rivera said in his studies when he was studying to be a Jesuit priest, he said that he found that the highest, the man who controlled and was the leader of the Masonic order throughout the world is the Black Pope. So all of these rulers throughout the Middle East, Johnny, are working for the Jesuit general of the Catholic Church. Well, now that we've come back to the Jesuit leader, are you familiar with the Jesuit oath? Yes, I am. Basically, Johnny, what what the Je- what the Jesuit oath comes down? Go ahead. We're I'm probably sorry. going to go a couple minutes into uh, archive. So, people, if the show stops, go back and listen to the end of the show in the archives area. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, my friend. Well, the the Jesuit oath, Johnny. Um, basically. The Jesuits are saying, we will kill, we will maim, we will do... Well, here, I'll read it to you. I have it on page 11 and 12 of my book, The Secret Terrorist. The Jesuit oath, in part, says this, I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own or any mental reservation, whatever, even as a corpse or cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia, the militia of the Pope. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth. And that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition. I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics. Rip up the stomachs and the wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls. 
in order to annihilate forever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poniard or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. And that's the enemy that we face. Absolutely. It's it's a group of it's a group of people, both men and women, that have taken an oath that they will kill. They will do whatever is necessary to see the Protestant Reformation destroyed. In fact the the very the very essence of why the Jesuit order was created was to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And if they don't destroy it, then they have no reason to exist. And uh, based on what I see in my Bible, Johnny, that um, there, there will be a group of people living on this earth at the end of time that will show the world and the universe the the triumph of the Protestant Reformation. And that group of people we find in Revelation 7 and 14 called the 144,000. This group of people, Johnny, will will face the every onslaught of the devil and his agents, the Jesuits, every onslaught they can throw. And this group of people will stand through the mighty power of Jesus Christ and will oppose them. And... Uh, they they will triumph, Johnny, and they will triumph gloriously. I believe that. So the end game of this Jesuit group would be what? If you had to sum it up really quickly, and I have questions here from folks who want to know if it does Barack Obama play into the Jesuit order in any way? Oh, absolutely, he does Johnny? Absolutely. Um, Johnny, the ultimate goals of the Jesuit order, number one, is to destroy everything that Protestantism stands for. And what what Protestantism stood for was religious freedom, civil freedom, and economic freedom. Or in other words, the right to worship God as we choose, um, Governments of the people, by the people, and for the people, representative government, and a strong middle class. Now, those those are the fruits in the religious, civil, and economic fabric of this country. Johnny, the Jesuit order has got to destroy those things, and they're in the process of destroying those things today. Now, the other thing, Johnny, is to reestablish the authority of the Catholic Church and the Pope in this world. And so that, Johnny, is their other goal. They've got to destroy Protestantism, and at the same time, they've got to reestablish the authority of the Pope and the Catholic Church throughout this planet. And uh, based on what Revelation, the book of Revelation says, Johnny, that the beast, uh, will seek to cause all the world to worship the way they tell us to do. And I believe that's the ultimate goal of the papacy uh, at this time in Earth's history, is to get all the world back to honoring the Catholic Church. Well, you've definitely given us a lot to chew on tonight, my friend. Well, I tell you, Johnny, there's a whole lot more. There's a whole lot more, but uh, you know, glad I could be a part of the program with you, and I uh, just would invite all well, the I'm listeners. Truly grateful. Well, and, Johnny, uh, if any, if anybody would like, well, if they would like, Johnny, I'll give them my address. Uh, my address is PO Box one four one seven. That's PO Box one four one seven. Uh, the town I live in is Eustis, that's spelled E 
U S T I S E U S T I S. The state is Florida, and uh, the zip code is three two seven two seven. Just have them write to me if they could throw in. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into finances, but if they could throw in a, a little bit of money just to help out with expenses for the books and uh, postage, that would be great. Um, and I'd be happy to send and, and write a little note and say, please send me a copy of both your books, and I'd be happy to send them to them. Well, it, it would really behoove anyone who hasn't read these books to read them and, and read them from cover to cover. I plan on going back and rereading mine. I mean, this was really an eye opener for me, and uh, as a result, you know, uh, I plan on making some changes with the show. Nothing too drastic, but uh, take the show in a little different direction. I'm even looking at a new opening theme song for the show. Um, but wow, I mean, true eye opener, folks. Get this book. Get these books. And, and Bill. Uh, sir, I really want to say thank you for you agreeing to be on the show tonight. Johnny, it's been my pleasure, and uh, if I can ever be of help again or we can work it out, I'd be happy to come on with you again. God bless oh, I would you. Love and somewhere down the road to have you back on. Well, let me know, Johnny. I'd be happy to work with you, and uh, God bless you and, and your dear wife, and uh, have a, a wonderful new year. And uh, I'll wait to hear from you again. I will definitely make that happen in the future. And uh, it looks like we're over time this time. We're out of time. So uh, I want everybody to remember that we are starting a new year tonight. And uh, with that new year, we have new chances to do things better than we did last year. You know, I'm sure that I made plenty of mistakes, and I'm sure you did too. And we can all change. We have time to change, and we can do better. We can be better people. And I would encourage you to be better people. I mean, after what we've heard tonight, you know, I would deeply, deeply encourage you to be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeing whom he may devour. I mean, that's just the simple truth of it. I mean, this this stuff is frightening, folks. But we uh, we need to remember that God is still in control. Mm-hmm. And, folks, just until next time, take care of yourself and each other. Have a good night and Happy New Year. Carry on my wayward sons.